Hi, welcome to a session of uh, Easy Dharma for the New Normal. And this is uh, the fifth um, chapter of Introduction to Buddhism by Geshe Gyasa and Gyatso. And I'm afraid to refresh the screen because it might take forever to load. So I hope it will come on in my notification and I see you from there. I uh, don't see anything. Uh, just give me a moment. Uh, am I on? All right, now I'm back to normal. I'm on. I'm on. Good. All right. Okay, cool. Okay, anyway, let's start the reading again and let's continue on. So uh, my apologies for the technical problems. I'm not a technical person, but everything can be handled, right? You know. Okay, our precious human life. As we have seen, it is possible to take rebirth from any one of the six realms, depending upon what kind of karma ripens when we die. This time, we have taken rebirth as a human being, and so we have now have the opportunity to enjoy all the advantages of human life. If we contemplate these advantages, we will realize that this life is very precious because it presents us with a unique opportunity for spiritual development. Compared to an animal life, for example, a human life generally provides the good f is good food, shelter, and freedom from predators. But the greatest advantage of being human is being having the special opportunity we have to develop our mind and thereby to free ourselves from suffering. Human life has almost limitless potential, but we will be able to realize this potential only if we first learn to appreciate it. Therefore, we need to reflect again and again on the special opportunity we now have. We have if we develop a, a deep appreciation for the preciousness of, of this life, we will definitely make a determination to use it wisely. Then we will feel that our life has become truly meaningful. All right. So, um, as I, I, I got to repeat a little bit of what I said earlier, which was that this topic our precious human life is an important topic, is an essential topic in um, the Lam Rim. It's an, that means it's an essential topic that we need to study and understand and comprehend according to tradition, according to the Lam Rim, in order to develop higher attainments, especially renunciation. Renunciation is the most one of the most important realizations we need to develop. All right. So what happens is. So what happens is, okay, good evening to you guys. And let me open you guys up so I can see your comments live as well. Oh, yeah, the screen is just not working properly. Okay, finally it's working. This Facebook has changed things around. Good evening to Miss Lam, Kin Ho, Wei Ting, Jacinta, Esther, Jillian, Sharon, Phoebe. Thank you very much for joining me. And I, I, I don't know if those people who came in earlier in the previous live stream, in, they probably ran away. <laughs> but thank you for being patient with me with my, you know, technical uh, issues. So, yeah. So generally, when you think of precious human life, this teaching on precious human life, you think, oh, it's for people who have no gratitude, people who are selfish. We don't think it's, it's us. And then what happens is... Um, it is not just for them. It is. It helps us when we read, when we meditate, when we contemplate, when we think about how precious this human life. It it does help us in terms of developing gratitude. It does help us in terms of develop opening our hearts towards spirituality. You know, it does help. But it's much more than that. As you when I read further down the the chapter, you understand um, what happens is um, it is not just that. It's an importance. Um, contemplation, important realization in order to develop renunciation. I'll get to renunciation, don't worry. I'm sure some of you think renunciation was that. Throw everything and go into the cave? No la, not, not exactly, not exactly. All right, let's continue. Oh yeah, before that, um, this part of the chapter, because it, it condenses a lot, so I have to explain a little bit more. Um, 
you see, when we talk, when we think about being a human, having a human rebirth, we can we also have to contemplate where uh, where else we could possibly take rebirth. We can possibly take rebirth as an animal. We can possibly take rebirth as a spirit. We can possibly take rebirth as a hell being, okay, in hell. So animal, spirit, hell. So the level is not under the ground. Animals are not under the ground. My animals is reverse. The level downwards represent the level of suffering that you experience. So the lower you get, the more suffering you experience. Likewise, above humans, there'll be more physical pleasures. So there's the above humans is uh, demigods and uh, good, the god realms. So these are places you can take rebirth. And the, okay, some of the misconceptions, people think, oh, I want to take rebirth as a, as a god, you know. And there are places you can take rebirth where, you know, uh, you experience a lot of bliss, you experience a lot of pleasure. But the problem about that is it will burn up a lot of our karma, a good karma. Because to take rebirth is not merits, it's good karma. So when you, you have a lot of good karma, it, it propels you to take rebirth in a higher realm. That is possible. And once you take rebirth there, you will be too busy enjoying yourself. You'll be too busy enjoying yourself. You don't realize that you wasted your time. Actually, a lot of humans, a lot of people we know uh, also end up that doing that. They enjoy themselves, they, they have a good life, they do this, they do that. In the end, when, when the time comes, they, they have to go. When they go, what, what the problem about enjoying, having all these enjoyments is that it takes up all our good karma. So when we burn out so much good karma, right, what remains is our bad karma. So we take a negative rebirth. Most of the time, the lowest. For the God realms, they take uh, rebirth in hell. It stayed in the Lamrim. You can check. And usually before they, take, they, they die, they have a, a, a premonition of where they will take rebirth and they'll be very scared. But nothing can be done already because it's too late. So in the Lamrim, taking that kind of rebirth in, in samsara, higher rebirth in, in samsara, okay? Higher rebirth in samsara is not good. Of course, lower rebirth also not good because the suffering is just too great. You know, when you are, you, when you are an animal, you do, firstly, animal is the worst thing in the animal realm is you're stupid. <laughs> Literally, you're stupid. You don't have the mental faculty to understand higher thought. Like all this Dharma talk, you can Dharma talk your pets to kingdom come, nothing is going to change them. Nothing. Nothing. They will not think of uh, improving themselves, developing compassion and all that. They will have some sort of gratitude, but that's it. A sense of gratitude. They, 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 you know, every, every person who, every being, every living being can feel compassion and kindness. They can feel and they can return that. They have that some sort of gratitude, but that's it. It will not, for an animal, it will not have the, the, the capacity to change them, transform them, make, me, make them different. Not possible. So animals is that. In spirit is extreme attachment, extreme suffering, loneliness, miserliness, loneliness. Huge attachments, usually like they haunt a particular place. They are attached to that place, huge attachments. So their attachments are so strong that they, they caught up in this place. Sometimes they're caught up in the situation they were, they, they were killed or they were they passed away, you know. So that, that was, uh, how is it? Okay, I see some people come on, like Tsatsa and Ong. Hello, and uh, Kelvin. Hi, hi. So what happens is, um, yeah. And then in hell, as you know, la, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that is uh, ingrained in all of us that it's a, a hellish place. It's a place of extreme physical pain and suffering. And, um, and it's just like other, some other d different uh, faiths, that, you know, um, other faiths that, that believe in a, a creator de divinity, a, a, div a divine being that creates and, and judges uh, humankind. And then when, upon death, they, there's a big judgment. And then they're, when they're evil, they are sent to hell for eternal damnation. Um, there, there, there's the difference. Their, their hell is eternal. The Buddhist hell is not eternal. Eternal means forever, never ends. Uh, in, in the Buddhist hell, 
it is it is subject to karma, subject to impermanence as well. So when karma is exhausted, the person, the being will have to take rebirth. They will die and they take rebirth into another higher realm, perhaps. Maybe as an animal, maybe as a spirit, maybe as a human being if if, if the karma permits. So yeah, that's the possible places we can take rebirth. And then the higher higher places you can take rebirth is the demigod, the Asura realm, and then the god realm, the Sura realm, uh, Deva or Sura. So the, these are the, the god-like realms are places where it's just like in the you know it's just like in the movies where they have a lot of you know palaces, you know, uh, um, enjoyments, girls, boys. Maid servants, beautiful things, beautiful clothes. It is said that you will never need to, uh, your body will just emit a lot of light when you're in the God realm. A lot of light and you never smell, you never need to shower, you never grow old for a long, long time. Okay, you do grow old, but not in that, not in the same way as in, in human being, in the human realm. So, but the problem about that realm is that you are too distracted because. All, all, everything that you want is provided. Everything that you can think of is given. You know, so everything is just provided, you know, on a silver platter. You don't have, there's no strife, there's no problems, there's no worries. Um, but there is a slight, uh, for like the God realm is usually their pride. And then um, in the demigod is usually their jealousy because in... And as the demigods are similar to the gods, but just not as powerful, not as beautiful, not as um, uh, has so much uh, material things. So they are constantly jealous of the gods. So they they are constantly uh, trying to do battle to win a war that will that hopefully will get the position and place of the gods, but they never do. So they are constantly at war. So um, so even in those higher realms, even with the pleasures and all that they still have problems, they still have difficulties, but that's not it. That the problem actually comes when, they, when everything is finished and they, they have to age and die, when the light has to subside. Instead that when they're dying, their lights will dim. The lights that comes out of the body will dim and then they will start to smell a little and the clothes will, you know, like wilt down and become like old and, and you know, everything becomes not so good already. And the other gods will notice and they will stay away. And what they do is, um, they then just before they die, they'll get a premonition. This is all, what I'm saying, what I'm describing right now is all from the long rim. So, you fool forever? No, no, Kelvin, you don't. So what happens is, just before they die, right? They, they have a premonition of where they will re take rebirth, which is usually in hell. And they'll be extremely scared, but nothing can be done at that, at that point. So in a, the point about all, all the understanding all these six realms is this. It tells you that you could take rebirth there. And it, the, a lot of the lamas these days give you a different interpretation of these six realms. A different interpretation of the six realms is not another realm that they want you to look at. They are the Lama still think still tell you that it does exist. It's just that it's beyond our perception at this point. What they're saying is don't look so far into another realm that we cannot see. We we no no karma to see at this point. Look in our realm. Look at among human beings. We are already living the six realms. There are people who live as human beings striving, have opportunities, moving up. There are people who, who live like animals. There are, li there are people who live like spirits. There are people who live like they are in hell, like war-torn countries, you know, as slaves as, and, and so forth. And then there are places where, I mean, even in, in every major city, there is always the, the wealthy and powerful. They are just like the, the, the demigods and the gods. So their, their, their wealth and, uh, and prestige and power and money is, is just the, the conditions they live is just like the gods and the demigods. And the problems and all the, the difficulties that they experience is just exactly like that on, on a scale of a human being. You know, because their scale as a, as a divine being is different than, than a human. So don't look so, so far away. Look within the human realm. 
it is possible for us to take rebirth. And the problems they experience, don't be blinded by what we see, as in what we pursue, what we think they, they, they are, they're going through. Actually, what they really experience is totally not what is portrayed, especially the rich and powerful, as you know. So nothing is as it seems. So it's uh, meditating on all this. Don't, don't meditate on the, don't contemplate on how wonderful it is to be rich and powerful and beautiful and youthful. Contemplate of what are the sufferings they experience. If you want to achieve realization and renunciation, you contemplate that because that's the truth. They, they go through a lot of suffering. Everyone goes through suffering in different ways. From the lower, in the lower realms, physical, obvious type of suffering, to the higher realms, which is more mental suffering, which is jealousy, family problems, drug problems, addiction, emotional issues, you know. So wherever you go, there is suffering, wherever you go. So that is supposed to help you to realize renunciation, all right? Okay, so I think I give you a gist already. Let me continue. It's just a few more pages only. Within our mind, there are 84,000 different delusions all of which produce mental pain or inner disease. This inner disease has no beginning, and until we abandon our deluded states of mind, it will have no end. If we do not overcome our attachment, for example, it will remain in our mind like an insatiable thirst, constantly giving rise to feelings of dissatisfaction and frustration. Similarly, all the other delusions such as anger, jealousy, and selfishness will continue to cause us mental pain whenever they arise within our mind. Even though we have, we have been suffering from these inner diseases since time without beginning, we now have an opportunity to eradicate them completely. Buddha gave 84,000 different instructions to cure these inner diseases. And, until, sorry, and unlike other living beings, humans human beings have the opportunity to receive these instructions and put them into practice. Thus, by relying upon Buddha's teachings, we can use our human life to gradually reduce and eventually eradicate altogether our delusions and all the pain and suffering to which they give rise. Generally, there are three ways in which we can use our precious human life to realize its potential. We can use it to ensure that in future lives we will be born as human beings. With all the conditions necessary for a happy and meaningful life. We can use it to attain complete liberation from suffering, or we can use it to attain full enlightenment or Buddhahood for the sake of all living beings. Okay, so this one goes into insight, in, into our mind. So when we, when we address a human, or precious human life, we address on what we, can do, what we can do with it. So what we can do with it is improve our mind. Because right now, whether we realize it, whether we don't realize it, whether we like it, whether we don't like it, we have a lot of issues in our mind. And our mind will continue to create more and more issues as long as we are selfish, as long as we, we hold on to our attachments. We are attachments, uh, aversion. Uh, attachment is things we like and we ex exaggerate its qualities. We exaggerate so much that it becomes an essential part of our life. For example, wealth. For example, uh, our family. For example, um, Businesses, for example, material possession, people, lovers, all these become so important in our lives that it takes up the space that when, when something happens, which is bound to happen, for example, we lose someone, we, someone leaves us, when someone is not happy with us, our, our, our whole world comes crumbling down or when we lose something that we really, really like, we really, really cherish. You know, you understand that's an attachment because we, we hold it so, so strongly that we are always chasing for it, especially material, material possessions, lovers, um, 
you know, uh, money, wealth, prestige, fame. For some people, it's fame, name. We we want it so much, so we keep tr trying and trying to get it, but it always eludes us. And when we do attain it, some of us, some of us are very lucky. With, with I, I don't know if you can call it lucky. We do attain it, then. But when we have it, we are so afraid to lose it. We're so afraid that it gets lost. We're so afraid that it degenerates, that it, that it becomes you know if it's a material thing, it becomes like um, it breaks down. Or if it's a person, it doesn't break down lie. If a person, if they age and then it, and then you know. Or a relationship, it, we lose them, they go away, they, 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 we break up, there's a breakup, there's a divorce, you know. So the, all these things are a manifestation of attachment. So what happens is they are wrecking havoc in our lives. And so it tells us no matter, so it, it, what happens is when, when we have all these problems, not just, we're not just talking about attachment, attachment is just one aspect, we have jealousy, we have, um, you know, we have what, jealousy, attachment, we have anger, for some of us anger, for some of us is, is jealousy, for some of us is uh, extreme miserliness, you know, we are very miserly about things. Miserly mean, miserliness means we hoard onto certain things, on, onto material things, or we hoard on, and we're so protective of our, our wealth, or we are so stingy, we don't want to give out anything. So when you, when, when you are required to bring out something, it's so difficult. You know, so there, there are many, many manifestations and, um, and that's what the, the Buddha has pointed and he said that all these are manifestations of a deluded mind. Because when you overcome it, it is possible to overcome it. It is possible and it, it, it is possible to be free of it. And when you're free of it, the freedom that comes with it is incredible. Okay, so we will go on like that experiencing over and over again because as long as we do not overcome our delusions we will continue to experience its effects again and again and again no matter how you want to talk convince yourself convince other people that you you don't have it but actually we all do that's the thing so now we go into our lives as in, it says at the end of the, that, that page, it says that there's three ways you can, now that you appreciate, you know, your human life, there's three ways you can go about it. Okay, you can, you can either work towards getting, attaining the same type of fortunate human rebirth where you have all the, the, the wealth, the money, um, the leisure, the, the sound mind, the healthy body of a human being. You can achieve. You can. You can wish for that. It is. It is part of uh, what you know. You can do, or you can. There's three. One is uh, realize the full potential. Use it to get a human rebirth again. One is uh, to achieve liberation from suffering. Liberation for suffering is interesting. Liberation for suffering is what the, we were talking just now, the mind. All the problems to overcome your delusions, overcome your attachments and all that, to achieve a sort of a liberation, a sort of what is known as nirvana. All right? Nirvana is not enlightenment. Full and complete Buddhahood or enlightenment is not nirvana. It's more, more than that. Okay, so then there is... Then the last one is for the sake of all living beings to achieve complete Buddhahood. So you can achieve, you can go about these three ways according to the Buddha's teachings. All right. So at our level, most of us are actually, we, we, we pray for Buddhahood and for all sanctioned beings, but we're actually on the level of the first level, which is for next human rebirth. Because you know how we know? It's because of our effort. The, the level of effort that we we put in into our practice and uh, because right now we have so much attachments and so much commitments slash attachments slash whatever you want to call it 
you know, um, of, of a modern individual. Too busy for this, too busy for that. Commitments. We need to survive for some of us. For some of us. So what happens is uh, we are just at the level of if our spiritual practice, be, realistically, we're looking at a human rebirth again. All right. So um, that's wonderful. But, okay, the but comes later. Let me read. With a human mind, we can understand the existence of past and future lives. This understanding leads us to think beyond the preoccupations of this short life and to consider our welfare in future lives. We are led to the conclusion that if we want a good rebirth in the future, we must create the causes for it now in this life. How do we do this? We can create the causes for a human rebirth in our next life by practicing moral discipline. In this life, we can create the cause to have an attractive body in that life by practicing patience. And we can create the causes to enjoy abundant wealth and resources by practicing generosity, giving. We can create the cause for our wishes to be fulfilled by engaging in virtuous actions such as a joyful mind, we can create the cause for ha to have a calm and peaceful mind by practicing meditation. And we can destroy our ignorance and solve all our inner problems by improving our wisdom. We can create the cause to enjoy good health and long life by protecting life and helping the sick. And we can protect ourselves from lower rebirth and ensure that we are reborn as human being or God by making offerings, prostrations and prayers to the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and other human holy beings. In short, we can use this human life to create the causes for any good condition we wish to experience in the future. Non-human beings, such as animals, do not have this opportunity, no matter how skilled they may be, but at some and maybe at other things. For example, some animals are very clever at hunting and finding food, and birds are very skilled in flying, but animals cannot practice moral discipline or even develop the wish to practice it. All living beings, even worms and insects, can commit negative actions. Not only humans, human beings have the opportunity to purify them. Sorry, let me read that again. It didn't come out right. All living beings, even worms and insects, can commit negative actions, but only human beings have the opportunity to purify them. For example, we can recite with faith the names of the 35 confessional Buddhas in the Mayana Sutra of the Three Superior Hips. We can swiftly purify even the heaviest negative karma. This sutra can be found in Appendix 2. My, this is the 35 confessional Buddhas. All right? So what it's trying to say here is that it is possible for us to, we want to achieve a, a good rebirth so we can one of the things we can do is we practice moral discipline. What is moral discipline? Moral is, is keeping to your promises, holding vows. So, for example, you, 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 we seek refuge. So when we seek refuge, it's a, it's a form of commitment, it's a form of vow, it's a form of holding onto a, a, our word that we promise to take the Buddha as our refuge, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. That is a refuge. So when we take, when we receive refuge, we hold on to our refuge commitments, and the stronger we hold on to it, the greater the cause for us to take human rebirth. All right. So that's the main direct cause to for human rebirth is morality. And then there's other things like if you want to be beautiful, then you practice patience. You know, if, if you want wealth, then you practice generosity giving so it, it, it gives a very long you know if you want uh, a calm state of mind you practice meditation so that concentration and uh, meditation is concentration all right so if you want to you know all sorts of things like it tells you but that's not not really that uh the the, the main important part the next one is as animals you can't achieve all these things no matter how good they are at whatever skill, like surviving, like flying, like killing. In fact, most animals are born from their karma to even do more negative karma. Listen to this. Uh, when you take rebirth as an animal, you are equipped due to your karma to commit even more negative karma. 
because most animals kill to survive, kill to eat. All right, they they kill in order to survive. They kill in order to eat. They kill directly. So what happens is you create more negative karma to take another rebirth, another another negative rebirth. That's that's why Rinpoche said that. He it said it's important for us to never fall in as into the lower realms because once you take a negative rebirth, it's not one rebirth, it's hundreds of rebirths as animals, as spirits. And if you take take rebirth in hell, if you have that heavy karma, it'd be a, you, you're talking of hundreds of thousands of, li- of years or lifetimes. It was a very, very long time before you surface again. And, and when you take rebirth, surface means take a high rebirth. High rebirth, when you, you take a high rebirth, is a different period, different era, different Buddha already, I'm sure, by that time. So the karma is extremely heavy. Um, so when you take rebirth, one neg- just take one negative rebirth, it will just propel you further and further down. No matter how much merits you have, you have, you have uh, accumulated, you will just take one negative. And it's possible for all any of us. At this point, don't think that, oh, I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't, don't, don't do anything bad, that I will not take a negative reverb. It is possible because we have so much negative karma from previous lives. And in this life, we have actually a lot of heavy, subtle negative karma. Subtle, I mean as in emotional negative karma of being selfish, of being lazy, of being attached. Our attachments are very strong and our attachments are, the, the, the karma of attachments is very heavy. All right, so that kind of karma can propel us negative. Don't think we will not go to a negative verb. It is even easier for us because our attachments are heavy. And I um, mean, when, when we have heavy attachments, perhaps to food, to, to pleasurable things, what happens is it is possible to take rebirth as animals. All right? And next thing is, um, it said that, I mean, as a human being, we can improve ourselves and all that. And, it, and one of the things, one of the aspects that uh, Geshe Kyaosan said is that we, as a human being who practices Dharma, it is possible to purify karma. Okay? Other beings cannot purify karma because by the virtue of the fact that they don't practice the Dharma, they are unable to as animal, this specifically in comparison to animals. So for animals, they're unable to practice the Dharma, they're unable to purify the karma. They will only experience karma. There is a difference, purification and experiencing karma, okay? Purification does not mean you experience negative karma. You did, does not mean you lighten the karma. It's not about lightening the karma. Some people have this misconception. Purification is lightening the karma. So you still have to experience it by lightening it. No, purification is actually the purpose of purification is to remove it completely from the root. That's the purpose. And in order to do that, you need to apply the four opponent powers. Because we our application of four opponent powers is uh, due to our lack of practice, due to our lack of concentration. So what happens is the, the karma that we purify is, is lightening. So it has the effect of lightening it. So instead of perhaps, you know, experiencing a, um, a car crash or a, a, a person, you know, a freak accident, you know, like something falls on your head and, you, you know, you, you, you get a concussion. Um, instead of experiencing that kind of karma, you perhaps you get a scratch, perhaps you get a, you know, a bruise, a light bruise. So you experience that, for example. So that is purification. So the purpose of purification is relying on enlightening to purify our karma. In this case, the best, in a, according to Geshe Kyasang, he recommends for a person who is a practitioner, a beginner practitioner of sutra in this case, will be the, the minor uh, sutra of the 33 of the three heaps, sorry, 33 heaps, of the three heaps. That is the 35 confessional Buddhas. So by recitation of the sutra, prostration to the 35 confessional Buddhas, and if you can do the physical prostration, that will be excellent. It will purify tremendous amount of negative karma. All right. Why prostration to an enlightened being can purify karma? Why is it possible? It's because 
the Buddha, in order to become enlightened, they need to achieve. In not, they they have to achieve um, emptiness. They have to direct perception of emptiness, realization of emptiness, and through the realization of emptiness, they have purified all their own karma. And it is possible for them to purify other beings, people's karma. But you need to tap into their, into their energy by doing the recitation. So you are tapping into the, the Buddha's realization of emptiness in order to dispel, oh, sorry, not dispel, to purify our negative karma. All right? And, and the, the, the way to do it is the recitation of the 35 confessional Buddhas. And the, but the best way is actually prostration, physical prostration, combined with recitation because you're prostrating to each of the, you know, the, the fully enlightened Buddha. And they, are, they have taken certain vows that will purify a tremendous amount of negative karma in different aspects. All right. So, okay, I see. I forgot to ask questions, but if you do have questions, let me know. As like I can see right now, Sharon does. Can someone purify another person's karma by doing 35 confessional Buddhas? No, it's not possible. You cannot purify another person's karma. You can plan, you can... Um, what you can do is, when you do practice for them, you can dedicate the merits, dedicating merits to another person to overcome certain obstacle, you, it's possible, but you cannot help them, you cannot purify their karma. So when they are, what happens is, when if you dedicate uh, merits, it is possible to avert certain obstacles, certain problems, um, increase their merits so that they, they overcome their problems and difficulties because their merits is higher. So... Sometimes when our merits are higher, we can overcome certain obstacles naturally. But the karma is still there. So in order for us to achieve, uh, in order to overcome the root cause of our problems, we have to do the practice ourselves. We have to purify the karma. No one can do it for us. The Buddha cannot do it. If, if, if the Buddha, if we can do it, the defied confession Buddha is for someone else, then the Buddha could have done it for all of us. He's an enlightened being. You know, he has his, his, his power and ability is much more than us. So then the Buddha could have taken, purified all the karma for us. Lah, and then we will already be enlightened already. We don't need to be sitting here talking about Dharma. We're all sitting, you know, in some heaven. <laughs> So it's not possible for the Buddha to purify. It's not possible for us to purify someone else's karma. It is possible for us to dedicate merits. There is a difference, all right? So when, when the, the merits are dedicated, it overwhelms the negative karma temporarily. Temporarily. So when it overwhelms the, the negative karma temporarily, so they overcome, seemingly the, in, overcome the, the obstacle, uh, but the root cause of the problem is still there. All right. So um, unless you are highly attained yourself, you can help people purify. You must be attained. If you are attained, you can help purify their karma. That is possible too. But if you're not attained, and you, you, can't, you can't do that. You can only dedicate merits. Okay, because there are, there are lamas, there are mahasiddhas, great practitioners in the past who are attained, who have, who have reached certain level of attainments close to Buddhahood, where they are able to purify the karma directly by sometimes scolding, sometimes slapping, sometimes beating, sometimes, um, you know, all sorts of ways, physical ways, verbal ways, you know, and purify the karma of a particular person. Rinpoche is, in, in our, people who are close to Rinpoche would know this. He's, he usually the, does help to purify some, our obstacles and problems by, if you're close to him and you have a samai with Rinpoche, right? Sometimes scolding. Rinpoche would scold you and an obstacle will be purified. It, it, we have witnessed it in the Ladrang many times over. So that, that is if you are a teen. If you're not attained, you can't rely on, you know, do prabhuja for someone else to purify the karma. You can dedicate the merits, okay? And especially like Dodishuktan is very powerful to, for this. Dodishuktan does not take away our obstacles when we, so listen, we increase our merits simply and if it's our obstacle, it will purify. 
some degree of it. But the actual practice of purification, we still need to do. All right. Okay, let's see what else is there. Hi, Jerry. Hi, welcome. Uh, Mr. Lum, is it possible to transfer merits from a person to another? What's the difference between dedication of merits and transference of merits? I never heard of the, and there's a difference. Perhaps I think it's just a, um, it's the same thing, I think. It's just dedication of merits. I think in the Theravadan, they may call it transference of merits. But for us, we call it dedication. I think it's the same thing. So it's basically what you do is you do a certain puja soliciting a particular Buddha. For example, 35, no, not 35 government. For example, Doji Shukden, for example, we do medicine Buddha. Then at the end, we dedicate to a person. That's, that's the basis of how our puja house, when we do pujas, um, it's dedicated to a particular sponsor. And that helps a lot of people to heal, help a lot of people to overcome their medical, personal, and financial obstacles. That's the whole basis of it. So, so in order for for uh, for the thing for the process to happen, the the sponsor sponsors the puja. All right. So, and the double that's one level, and then the double marriage you're sponsoring. You're also sponsoring the organization, Kachara, for the Dharma to grow. So there's, there's more merits. And that helps in overcoming the obstacle. So no difference, I think, in transference and dedication. It's the same thing. Okay, where was I? Okay, here, here we are. Let me finish this. However, even if we are reborn as human being in the re next life, we st will still not be free from suffering. All living beings within the six realms experience one problem after another. They have to endure the sufferings of birth, sickness, aging, death, disappointment, frustration, and so on. Again and again in life after life. This cycle of uncontrolled death and rebirth pervaded by suffering is called samsara, cyclic existence. As human beings, we can understand how we are trapped in samsara with, causes, with what causes us to take rebirth in samsara and how we can escape from it. With this understanding, we will naturally develop a wish to escape from samsara and attain permanent freedom from suffering. This wish is called renunciation. If... With this motivation, we engage in the spiritual practice of moral discipline, concentration and wisdom that I explained in part 2 of this book. We will eventually eradicate all our delusions and attain complete liberation from samsara and, and all its problems. Complete liberation from delusions and suffering, however, is not the greatest goal we can accomplish with our human life. If we consider the plight of others, we will see that all living beings are trapped in samsara, experiencing terrible suffering in life after life. If we then rely upon Buddha's Mahayana teachings, we will be able to develop great compassion for all these great suffering beings. Seeing that the only way we can protect them from suffering is to develop the skills and qualities of a Buddha. We will make a strong determination to become Buddha for the sake of all living beings. This special mind is called Bodhicitta, or the mind of enlightenment. Once we develop bodhicitta, we become a bodhisattva and enter into the bodhisattva's way of life. The essence of a bodhisattva's way of life is the practice of the six perfections. The perfections of giving, moral discipline, patience, effort, mental stabilization, and wisdom. These are explained in part 3 of this book. We will practice the six perfections sincerely. Eventually, we will attain full enlightenment and become a conqueror Buddha. Just as Buddha, uh, Prince Siddhartha used his human life to practice Dharma and attain full enlightenment, so can we use our precious human life to do the same. If we realize that this precious human life has such great potential, we will feel extremely fortunate and we will decide not to waste it on meaningless activities, but to extract its essence by practicing pure Dharma. Okay, so everybody understand. I used to describe um, Bodhicitta as 
great like uh, great compassion, but actually it's not. Bodhi, um, bodhicitta is a little bit more than that, as explained. This is this is explained very very simple, in a very simple manner. And it's very very clear. I like it very much. All right. So um, let me know if you have any questions about it. In general, it is about. It gives you a gist about the whole process, you know, when we, since we, un, the from it all begins by looking in our life, our precious human life, and realizing it's how precious it is to be reborn. And then we realize that we are suffering. We realize that all our problems come from, you know, our mind. All our problems come from our delusions. Our emotional afflictions. Delusions equals emotional afflictions. So our emotional afflictions of jealousy, of selfishness, of anger, of um, of attachment, and so forth. You know, we we have all these things that develop from lifetime to lifetime. We carry it. So these will, if we we wish to for another human rebirth, we'll come back and do the same thing again, and. Hopefully, we will get again another human rebirth. But sometimes, because of the, the gravity and the heaviness of our karma, sometimes we get derailed and we take a negative rebirth. So once we take a negative rebirth, then it's very, very sad because um, it will be a spiral downwards. So that's why we, we, we have, we, in, in the Mahayana tradition, in the tradition of the Lamrim, we seek liberation, a higher liberation. Pabonka Rinpoche actually puts down the puts down the motivation for human rebirth. Actually, I remember reading about it. He he in his in in the liberation of palm of hands he puts it down. It says that that is that is useless. What's the point of just praying for you know working towards another human rebirth? You should work higher. Once you work higher, you will get another human rebirth and more. So that's that's the thing. Um, we should aspire at the be at the moment our efforts does not equate the high motivation at the moment but we can still contrive up you know, uh, generate not contrive up generate a higher motivation and think higher in a sense of when we do our practice think higher on not that we understand why we have to think higher because otherwise there's the, unfortunately that there's a truth that we have don't really have a choice if you look at the, the 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 way we suffer and how we suffer, we don't have a choice. If we if we want to continue to experience the same thing, then we continue the way we are. If we don't, then we have we work higher. We work, we work. It's a step by step process. Of course, we don't immediately become a bodhisattva overnight. We do step by step. By first, what we do is we first work on our mind and our delusions and our attachments. How do we work on the mind and delusions? We work on our uh, renunciation. All right. So that's most important at this point. In, is is to work on renunciation. And renunciation is that that wish to be free of. You know of 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 uh, this. Repetitive, repetitive, coming back again to experience the same thing again. That's one aspect of renunciation. Another aspect of renunciation is more deeper, which uh, comes from a teaching I've from Rinpoche. Sam Rinpoche, Al Rinpoche talks about having a type of mind, developing a type of mind, right? That when you that when you encounter difficulties and problems, we are calm, we are level headed, and we we will not get swayed. We even we we are stable even when we dif encounter difficulties even when we are are nice we'll be we will not be too attached we will not will rush you know to be we're so excited so because that at the moment we are uncontrolled our mind is uncontrolled because we when things are pleasant we are so we are so relaxed and then we want things to remain the way when things change when situations change it's bound to happen all of us grow old. You know, people come, people go, situations change, you know, like the COVID virus now. You know, there's a lot of things can happen in this world, in our world, in our lives, that can throw us off balance. And when we're thrown off balance, how do we react? 
So it is possible to develop a mind where we can be stable no matter what situation we are. That is a, a mind of renunciation. Okay, so it's a mind of when when um, when times are good. You when we have good things, we're like okay, you know it's nice, but we don't we don't yearn for it. We don't go towards it. We have it. We can enjoy it a little bit, and that's it. And because we don't enjoy it so much, and we don't yearn for it so much, because we have realized that that enjoyment is just temporary. All our enjoyments in this life is only temporary. It's only temporary, or it, it is something that it comes with a price. Yeah, for some of us, the enjoyment they experience comes with a price. And are we willing to pay the price? Most of the time, we are not. Or sometimes the, the price is too high. Sometimes it comes later. Sometimes we didn't even think about it. Because we only think about what we want. We don't think about paying the price. So what is paying the price? Whatever you need to get it. The effort you need to get. The time and effort you need to get it. Sometimes it's just too much. That it, 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 um, it takes up, consumes our life. It consumes our time. It consumes a relationship sometimes. It, it, it makes us, it's a waste of time in the end. Actually, in the grander scheme of things, a lot of things we pursue is a waste of time. But I know this is a little, a little on a higher level for some of us. We, we may not, you may not agree with me. But as we practice the Dharma, you will realize this. You will realize this. All right. I have come to the end of the session. Thank you very much. And before I do dedication, I would like to encourage you guys to please sponsor the teachings. Uh, it's not a lot of money as far as I recall. And um, it will be good for you. It will be good for the organization. I don't pocket any money. <laughs> I don't get paid for doing this live streaming at all. So it doesn't go into my pocket. Don't worry about that. It goes into Gachara. So it's a donation for the growth of the Dharma. It's a token sum. It's not a lot of money. But it for your karma, it's incredible. Because it's, it's for the... It's for Dharma teaching. You're sponsoring a Dharma teaching. It's for the growth of Dharma. So you should do dedication. When you when you do when you spon when you do uh, some sponsorships like that, you do dedication. Um, then it will be very powerful, okay, for you. So today's talk is sponsored by an anonymous person. Number one is anonymous. There are three people. Uh, is a dedication towards all beings liberation from suffering and attainment of pure compassion and wisdom. Second person is Diego. Dedication for all sanctioned beings. Third sponsor is from Mr. Lam, Lam Kok Lien, and family. May the Dharma shed, pervade uh, all ten directions and generate merits for his eminence to swiftly return to Kishara. Thank you very much, and I wish you good night. Janju Central Rinpoche, Maki Panagi Yushi, Keba Ya Mami Payang, Go Nengo to Pewa Show, Tony Tonga Rinpoche, Maki Panagi Yushi, Keba Ya Mami Payang, Go Nengo to Pewa Show, Daso Chinis Saba Giwadi, Tanandro, Jebo Jozo Los and Dropper, Tampin Purin the Sashi Show, Kewa Gondo Yana Lama Dan, Tremi Joki Pala Long Chochin, Sada Longi on Teranachoni, Doji Changi Gopan Yuto Show, Kewa Di. Yududa, Lama Sangye Jushuni, Chua Chikya Malupa De Sala Gova Sho, Chujira Bo Songa Ba, Chozo Nama Pewa La, Gigi Shama Chewa Dan, Tuni Malo Shang Sho, Dadan Shengi Dusun Dan, Chua Shlete Ne, Gya Wa Lo Son Drapa Yi, Tampa Rin Ba Gyu Shi, Nimo Dala Sen Tala, Nemi Ko Yen Tala Shin, Gya Sen Tatu Dala Pao, Kondro Son Yin Jin Gyu Lo, Kondro Son Yin Ngo Joso, Kondro Son Yin Ta Shi Sho, Gya Sun Lama Kusa Rap Tun Chi, Nam Ka Chin Yin Sho Gigi Pa Dan, Lo Son Te Mi Jumi San Son Gyi, Drumo So Tatu Ne Gyu Shi, Gandhi Rawi, Koi Shingam then, Tenden then, then, okay, I'm gonna Chen Rezik, one ten zing, yes, oi, Shabi City, Badu, then, Gyuji, Hong Tombing, or Drumaloba, then the Dallas, or so, Gordon Denver, Lojana, Geba, Suji, Shook, then, sell. Thank you. Good night, everybody.